Watch this space for updates. Got it. Watch Max Maxwell for updates. I like that. All right, everyone, welcome to another episode of the Max Maxwell Show. As you know, I like to bring you amazing guests and I like to give you accurate information. And today we have with us attorney Brian Huddleston, who is in Oklahoma. And something that I get all the time, a question is about what's going on with the Oklahoma law. But first, before we get started, let me introduce Mr. Brian Huddleston to the show. Welcome, sir. How are you doing today? Uh, good morning. Doing great. Thanks for uh, having me on your show. Absolutely. Well, you know, first of all, thank you for taking time out of your day to speak with someone like me because, you know, the purpose of my real estate channel and my YouTube is the audience is to really give accurate information. And I ran across your article a couple weeks ago and it was just, you know, it was enlightening and I don't know much about it. And I'm, I'm, I'm guessing and I'm assuming since you've been in real estate practice for a long time and you're actually a real estate investor yourself, that you kind of researched this and kind of said, hey, look, the title of your article was Wholesalers Beware You Have Until November 1. So let's talk about why they have until November 1 and what's going on. Well, sure. Um, well, uh, uh, over the last several years, I'm sure it's uh, happens. It's been happening all over the country. Of course, I just know about you know my neck of the woods, but mm -hmm. Uh, there's been a, a, a huge uptick in um, real estate transactions that have been facilitated by uh, what people call whole, wholesalers, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, is someone, um, at least by my de my definition, and, I, and I'll say uh, now uh, we'll have a Oklahoma statutory um uh, definition of a, of a, a so-called wholesaler now with this new uh, amendment to the statute, but um, an individual who uh, 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 negotiates a purchase and sale agreement with the, the homeowner, the mm -hmm. seller, uh, but who has no, uh, generally, no intention of taking title to that property. They, they, they don't want to buy it. They don't want to own it. Um, and they may or may not disclose that to the uh, homeowner, the seller. The the uh, the negotiation may uh, look much like a uh, for sale by owner, where the uh, buyer um, uh, creates the impression, rightly or wrongly, in the seller that um, the buyer is buying the house. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's not what's the intent of the of the wholesaler. The intent is to uh, immediately uh, try to uh, uh, resell that deal, that contract, that interest in the purchase and sale agreement that the wholesaler has with the homeowner to a third party, uh, and and generally that third party is a a, a regular investor a purchaser of of real estate um, who's going to buy it with minimal inspections, uh, minimal due diligence, uh, sort of as is, where is, mm -hmm. with all faults, um, and probably not with without any kind of financing contingency, a, a, a cash deal. So it's a quick a quick uh, flip of the of the uh, of the contract to a, a new buyer, and they the the uh, mechanics of the transaction. Uh, generally, are either the uh, the wholesaler assigns the uh, purchase and sale agreement with the home that he has with the homeowner, assigns that contract uh, that that buyer's interest in the contract to the investor, and then the investor goes on to close the sale directly with the the homeowner, and the wholesaler simply gets a fee or commission. <clears throat> on the transaction, that's that's the reason they're doing it. There's a markup between the, the price the wholesalers uh, has in the contract with the homeowner and the price that the wholesaler has with the with the investor. The other, uh, uh, or or the there's a markup fee. The other way to do it is what we call a dual or back to back closing, mm -hmm. which uh, is uh, getting much more common now. Where there's an instant where the wholesaler is in title because you have the closing of the purchase and sale with the homeowner, say at 11 a.m. on a Thursday and at 11.01 a.m. on that same Thursday, 
is the closing of the uh, sale from the uh, wholesaler to the investor. Mm -hmm. So there's two complete back-to-back -back simultaneous closings. And for an instant, the, 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 the title is in the wholesaler as the buyer before the, the wholesaler signs a deed uh, as the seller to the, to the uh, investor. So there's sort of double the closing costs and uh, for the title and closing company, but that uh, is familiar with closing, uh, dual closings for, for wholesalers, which is, uh, yeah, there's plenty of, plenty of title companies here in town that, that, that'll facilitate that. Well, all over the state, really. So in, in that particular transaction you speak of when you say that there's an A to B and then a B to C, is the, is the wholesaler actually bringing the funds to close on the deal? And then... Well, no, no. I mean, um, I'm sorry, did you have more to that? Question? No, no, because no, that, that, that's the end of it there. Okay, so, uh, and I, I prepare a set of forms. I, I, just so you know, I, I don't have anything against wholesalers or the mm -hmm. wholesaling industry. Uh, it, it, uh, it serves a purpose. Uh, I do think there are, uh, have been some, um, some, uh, self-inflicted wounds that have caused by wholesalers that maybe have caused the need for the statute, which we maybe mm -hmm. we want to discuss, but, but, um, no, it's been my experience, at least with the, with the, uh, the folks that have come to me for a set of, uh, sort of a wholesale kit, you know, that initial contract with a homeowner. The assignment agreement with the investor, maybe a, 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 a secondary contract with the investor if it's a dual mm -hmm. closing, um, a, a, an addendum or amendment to the contract, maybe a memorandum that gets recorded in order to uh, keep keep uh, uh, keep the uh, from losing the deal. Uh -huh. uh, we can talk about that too, but but uh, um, the the people that I have met in the wholesaling industry typically are enterprising uh, folks that um, want to try to find a way to get into the real estate uh, industry and make some money at it with that um, without much capital um, mm -hmm. to, to begin with. So no, they, they um, typically will have a very low or no earnest money deposit on their contract with the homeowner, maybe 500 bucks, maybe, maybe nothing. It's a, it's a point of negotiation. If you can, if you're a wholesaler and you can get a homeowner to yeah. sign a contract with you with with no earnest money, <laughs> hey, more power to you, right? I mean, it's 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 an arm's length negotiation with that with that homeowner, right? Uh, uh, and then and then uh, they're not they're not closing, they're not buying the property. Uh, the investor is so at the at the closing, whether it's an assignment of that of an interest in that 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 contract or the dual closing, the, the, the purchase money funds are flowing from the investor mm -hmm. through to the, uh, uh, homeowner sort of seamlessly all through the escrow account at the title and closing company or, or, or whatever escrow agent you're using. I mean, you, you don't have to close at a title closing company here in Oklahoma. You can, you can close at the office of an attorney, you know, and, yeah. and the attorney can use his trust account as the, as the escrow account. So, but no, they don't, they typically aren't using any money of their own. And that's one of the attractive uh, things about making a bunch of money uh, as a, in the real estate industry without any capital. I mean, if you can, and this, this gets back to, I think the reason for the statute, but if you can find a off market home, a homeowner that for whatever reason uh, signs that uh, you can get them to sign a contract with you for twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars below fair market value, uh, and then you can uh, assign that contract to an investor for a you know ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollar markup. Mm -hmm. You're you're making some real money um, uh, as a wholesaler. Yeah. You know, I don't, I'm not saying that that's you know typical, but you know I've I've seen many uh, wholesalers make you know well over five or ten grand. Uh, I, I on think a it's flip. Yeah. 
on the contract to negotiate. I think it's pretty common these days where people try to get around ten thousand dollars with their negotiation for a deal. You know, some are more lucrative, some are less. Um, you know, the, the, like you said before, there are some bad apples in in any industry, right? And in, in doctors and attorneys yeah. and other licensed agents. I started out as a as a realtor. I started out as a licensed agent. I actually opened at 21 years old. I had my own brokerage. And wow. from what I from what I learned at, at, at having my brokerage and, and being a licensed agent is that most people or most licensed agents don't go after the houses we go after. They typically don't go after the type of until they see that, oh, wait, I'm leaving money on the table. If you're an agent, most agents want to list the prettiest house on the prettiest, best side of town and go after that market. There's a market of, of houses that agents won't don't want to list and put on their portfolio as something for sale. And I think that created an opportunity for people to come in because there's still a problem. But besides that, yeah. Oklahoma is passing or amending a, a bill, I believe, so that they they are requiring, I guess, quote unquote, wholesalers to go out and then become licensed agents. Yeah, uh, it's a <clears throat> uh, we have a a in the uh, what we call the real estate license code, which mm -hmm. uh, is that section of our Oklahoma statutes that requires realtors like you know you to to obtain a. A, a realtor license mm -hmm. and 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 uh, there uh, we don't need to get into that but I, i'm sure all the viewers know there's quite a bit involved in in far as education training continuing education and uh and uh rules applicable to uh realtors and for the protection of the industry and for the protection of the buying and selling public here in, mm -hmm. in oklahoma and I'm sure in every other state that requires realtors to be licensed so they have a, a there's a very minor change to the to the license code um but huge if you're a real a wholesaler and the vi the very minor addition to the statute um uh makes it unlawful for a person to that who does not have a uh, real estate license um to publicly market for sale an equitable interest in a contract for the purchase of real property between a property owner and a prospective purchaser. So pretty small, minor change in the statute, but massive in that um, that is exactly what a so-called wholesaler is and does. They, they market an equitable interest. In other words, their buyer's interest in the purchase and sale agreement. Mm -hmm. They they market that to a prospective purchaser who will then take step into the shoes of the buyer, um, either as an assignee of that purchase and sale agreement or um, through that dual closing process. And uh, uh, so that's what a that's that's the new definition in Oklahoma of a wholesaler, someone who publicly markets for sale an equitable interest in a real estate purchase and sale agreement. So Brian, there's a few things as, as somebody who has done hundreds of these transactions uh, myself and, you know, I fix and flip, I do new construction and I do, you know, development projects. Now when they say, in your opinion, when they, first of all, what I'm getting at to is how enforceable is this going to be? Because when they say somebody publicly oh. markets that, right. So what if you have a relationship with a list of buyers, who that you communicate with privately, you know, so I'll take the thumbs up there. So there's a, there's a quite a few things also in your, in your opinion. And you know, I've, I've had a dozen failed businesses right in the past. I'm 36 years old. I'll be 37 shortly. I've, I've failed a lot in my, in my life. in as far as businesses, this type of transaction is actually common amongst a lot of different businesses, including like the mortgage world, including the the car industry there's some type of assignment of of interest and in things and and even in bigger yes. com bigger commercial deals there's assignments in i mean five ten million dollars worth of property 
can be assigned to somebody else without somebody taking title. Do you think this is going to be a domino effect that's going to affect these type of things or no? Uh, well, I think it's going to affect uh, uh, unlicensed uh, wholesalers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right away. Um, <laughs> all of these other transactions that you've mentioned that have been going on, uh, uh, how do I say this? I think they're quite often uh, facilitated by legal counsel, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, and uh, like me, and we don't have to have a real estate license. We've never had to have a real estate license. The, the law license um, kind of trumps everything, yeah. but in, mm -hmm. in it, in it, uh, there's a specific carve out in this statute that's like I said, the statute's been around forever, just minor amendment to it, but there's a specific carve out for attorneys. So, um, yeah, if you're talking about a sophisticated uh, transaction involving millions of dollars uh, or millions of dollars worth of real estate, mm -hmm. there's going to be a uh, buyer's counsel, seller's counsel, uh, 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 lender's counsel, you know, bar, bar, there, there's, <laughs> there, that's how, um, that's how I, that's what I do. Right. I mean, exactly. that's, that's, that's what, that, this, this, uh, buying and selling of, uh, of these, uh, of these, uh, individual single family homes, uh, in the wholesaling industry by and large does not involve, uh, attorneys, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it, it involves, uh, just, uh, uh, a lot of times, like I said, for you know, individual people that are unrepresented, and um, and and without realtors, and therefore shenanigans ensue, and that's why we have the shoot now because of the the various uh, shenanigans that have have come about as a result uh, this being an, a, a completely unregulated area of the uh, of the real estate. Now, one thing I do like about the state of North Carolina is that we are a attorney state, as in we don't have title companies. And so all of our real estate transactions go through an attorney, which I think makes it safe for both parties because there's always a licensed attorney online. Like they're, they're risking their, 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 their bar license by doing these yeah. transactions. So they, yeah. They, yeah, you don't want to risk those for you know a couple hundred bucks in transaction fees. So it's always, I think it's above board. I think where you run into title companies and title title states, I think is where you start to get a little, you know, things can happen, whatever. I, I don't live in one, so I don't know. But, you know, I, I think- We are one of those, uh, those states you're talking about where probably 95, 99% of all residential real estate purchase and sales occur without any- attorney involvement at all other than the uh the title attorney that uh that might review the title commitment and the abstract in order to to say that the title's marketable and that mm -hmm. attorney works for the title company not for anybody else he only represents the title company so you so you're getting no legal advice as a buyer or seller or the attorney for the lender who's only working for the lender for those loan documents that if there's a, if there's a, a mm -hmm. purchase money loan. So yeah, there's nobody looking out for the buyer or the seller in Oklahoma, uh, in a, a residential real estate transaction, uh, except sort of the, uh, the realtors who have, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, all kinds of, of fiduciary and, and obligations, uh, or else they can, you know, get their ticket punched by the Oklahoma Real Estate Commission. So, you know, realtors uh, typically will make sure that a a, uh, a form purchase and sale agreement that I would say is uh, fair and balanced between the interests of the buyer and the seller, they they're going to use a a what we call the the board form Oklahoma Real Estate contract. There's going to be a listing agreement. There's going to be disclosures. I mean, all kinds of things to try to make it less of a caveat emptor, buyer beware state, as far as if you're the residential buyer, you have all of these um, things that are, excuse me, protections built into the uh, mm -hmm. 
into the into the into the transaction because of the forms that the realtors use. None of that uh, is uh, is uh, necessarily involved in a in a, uh, a wholesale transaction, but it will be now <laughs> if the wholesale transaction involves a uh, licensed realtor. I just don't think that that's going to happen, though. I mean, I, I mean, it's that's my two cents, but I don't, I don't, I think things are going to continue to happen the way before. The only difference will be that you won't have wholesalers. Say you get a, you know, say you're one of these big wholesaling companies. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not really familiar with them, but there, you might be. There are some, some large companies as opposed to like, you know, the individual guy that's a wholesaler mm -hmm. and, and they'll, um, and they will publicly market, uh, to, uh, to individual, you know, owner occupier, potential homeowners, these contracts that they've obtained uh, uh, from a, you know, the, you know, the, a, a, a wholesale, uh, they're marketing a, an interest in the contract. Um, that won't happen because it says you can't publicly market an interest in the contract. But but all of these deals where the wholesaler is is turning around and, and calling. Uh, uh, without any public marketing, without any yeah. advertising or anything, you know, MLS, Facebook Marketplace, Craig's, Craigslist, any of that, they're just they're just saying uh, they're calling you know someone like me up on the phone and saying, hey, I've got a, uh, a a contract that I'd like to to tell you tell you about. Uh, would you like to um, to you know to to take it over, as, you know, receive an assignment or do the double closing? And that's not public. That's a that's a private phone call with an individual known, typically knowledgeable real estate investor, you know, sophisticated okay, real estate investor, who the legislature is is less concerned about, I, I assume, because of the public marketing uh, notion here. So wholesalers that um, have a massive loophole that they can rely on in this in this uh, amendment to the statute, at least. Again, that's my two cents. Is that I, I'm 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 placing a great emphasis on the publicly market, and I'm um, agreeing with you 100. percent I mean, there's a couple ways in in different places where the larger companies like myself have started to self-regulate. One, we we have in-house agent, and and a lot of people, you know, the the National Association of Realtors does a good job at marketing. So a lot of people make synonymous agent and realtor. And they're really two different things in the sense that the Association of Realtors is a private organization. You get your license from a government body, which is the commission in the state. And in order to gain access to the local MLS, you have to pay these fees and be a member of the Association of Realtors. So an agent necessarily doesn't have to be a realtor, but a realtor does have to be an agent. And so with, with that being said, there is some um, ways that we have went around. We don't have that issue yet in North Carolina. I do see, I do predict a lot of governors and a lot of uh, attorney generals in states will start to copycat. The Illinois has, has something in, that they passed. Uh, I think the city of uh, Philadelphia has, has passed something. But we, it's, uh, there's a, there's, now there's needs for money. So now there's transactional funding where a transactional funding company will come in and fund A to B so that you can sell to B, uh, B to C. And that's one way. Another way is to create your own private um, list of people who have to register to a website to see that you're private deals. It's not a public information. Uh, another thing that I've been talking about since I've, you know, this is a way, you know, I, there's, a, there's a good, very good side to wholesaling. In my first year, we recovered, I think it was, uh, there was tens of thousands of dollars worth of unpaid taxes in our city to vacant and abandoned homes. Um, uh, I looked up a stat, there's roughly 11 to 12,000 vacant homes in Oklahoma. And that's typically what they're going to go after. There's 18, there's 17 to 18 million vacant homes nationwide. And that's usually something that people, that wholesalers go after. And, and agents and realtors do not go after those homes because they're not attractive and marketable to list. But one of the lacking things that investors, 
wholesalers, whoever you may call them, are they don't have any representing body such as agents have the Association of Realtors. So the Association of Realtors can use their, their money to lobby states like Oklahoma and Illinois to, to make it in their interest so that they can, whatever benefits them. And so, but one thing I've noticed is over the last few years is that single family residence has become a new asset class for Wall Street. And a lot of Wall Street gets a lot of their portfolio from the middleman because they don't have the time to market to these people in the properties. So I, I do see that when a wholesaler is serious about this business, they do go out and seek counsel, somebody like yourself, so that they can navigate amongst the laws, with, within the laws, and, and still continue to have a vibrant business and help their community, help put more housing on market, which we all know we definitely need right now. And so, like you said, when we started there, there is a good side. There is a, a, a good reason for wholesalers that doesn't necessarily is highlighted. Um, but like you said, if you don't want to deal with the, the, I would say, if you don't want to oppose this law, which I think nobody should, November 1st, you have to go, you better go get licensed if you, can, if you want to continue to, to do, to practice wholesaling. Well, if you, if certainly, if you, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, intend to publicly market your your uh, equitable interests in the uh, the purchase and sale agreement, mm -hmm. but I I think that most wholesalers will say, well, I don't need to get licensed because I'm not going to publicly market this contract. <laughs> I'm going to only privately market it. In fact, they may even put in their contract documents now that that uh, you know, say the one with the homeowner that you know this contract is assignable. However, the buyer seller agree and understand it will not be publicly marketed. <laughs> and then, you know, and then uh, and then the assignment agreement uh, or the the uh, the uh, back to back purchase agreement with the uh, investor, you have a clause in there that says that. Uh, buyer and seller understand this 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 uh, 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 interest has not been publicly marketed that it's a private transaction with a uh, a uh, you know a uh, uh, an individual who's who's uh, uh, has a, uh, a a practice of investing in mm -hmm. homes so I mean as a like I said as a as a lawyer I can think of a number of clauses you could load it up to try to self-serving in a self-serving way try to make sure that you you drive through this uh mac truck size loophole in the uh in the statute uh, not but i mean if you're if it is a back-to-back -back closing uh I, I mean uh if you buy property and take title to it and then you resell it there's nothing in the statute that says that the resale uh, event has to happen a year later, a month later, a day later, uh, a minute later. You know, uh, so, so you're it, it, you're not you're not you're not getting an interest in a contract. You're you're uh, in turn reselling property that you do in fact own, even though you may have only only owned it for a extremely short period of time <laughs> so so uh i think there's there's those two things but but i gotta tell you i you know the 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 law says that the oklahoma real estate commission can uh implement regulations to uh uh enact uh, uh enact uh regulations uh rules to implement the statute and it wouldn't surprise me if they don't, don't try something to to make sure that that the public market uh, language statute uh, doesn't uh, swallow the whole, you know, amendment in the in the in that in that loophole. But uh, you know, at least for right now, you, you know, I, I guess the thing is that if you if, if you in any way uh, are found by a uh, a district attorney or a uh, uh, a county 
prosecutor, someone like that, to have violated that the statute, the the, the law, the, the penalties are fairly significant. You know, it's a, a fine of up to $1,000, imprisonment in, in the county jail for up to six months or both. Um, you can uh, 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 obviously lose your license, uh, but or in this case, if you're unlicensed, uh, uh, lose the ability to ever get one because you know obviously you can't imagine the real estate commission that's going to do a background check on you uh, <laughs> giving you a license after you've uh, been deemed like this so that you, 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 you'd, you'd lose the ability to get a license um, you can't you would, you would forfeit the commission one of the things that I do think is going to be a bit of a, a danger for wholesalers is that um, that contract, arguably is not enforceable between the, because it's a violation of the law, mm -hmm. you know, to, to this uh, marketing of the interest. So um, uh, the wholesaler is going to have to do something to, to, to guard against the, uh, say they come to me uh, with this wholesale contract, I can look them up to see whether they've got a license or not, because that's public. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I find out this, you know, I know this wholesaler is unlicensed. He's brought me this contract. It's a really good deal. You know, it's like, you know, 40 grand below fair market, you know, and whatever. <clears throat> and so uh, instead of me paying a $20,000 commission to the wholesaler, I just ring it being up the, uh, the homeowner that signed the contract and say, hey, I, you know, I know you got under contract for whatever, 100 grand to this wholesaler guy, but that contract's illegal. Let me show you the statute. Uh, couldn't do it. He's not licensed. And uh, I'll, I'll, so you can ignore that contract, tear it up and do a new one to me for 105 grand. Mm. So they, <laughs> so I just, I just, I just aced out the wholesalers and, and went direct and saved a bunch of money uh, as an investor, uh, you know, um, you know, burning that wholesaler. Now, I don't know how often that's going to happen, but I think it's a real danger for the wholesaler. They've got a really good deal that they could get burned. Um, and uh, I do think that's one of the reasons why sometimes wholesalers will record a memorandum of contract in the title record to, to show, to, to cloud the, the, the homeowner's title to where they can't sell to someone else because the wholesaler is re recorded a memorandum that says that this property is under contract. Now a realtor would never do that, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, but if it's not enforceable, the memorandum really doesn't mean anything either. Well, it clouds the title. You're not, you know, no buyer is going to, uh, you know, buy a, a property with, with title that's not insurable. Mm -hmm, and that's, that's going to be a giant exception or requirement to any title insurance that that memorandum of contract be removed um, with any subsequent buyer. So, no, I think it, but, but, uh, it, it, but you, I agree with you that it could be subject to getting canceled in a, mm -hmm. a legal proceeding, but that again ties that. up. Yeah, you know, time as you know, time kills deals. Every time. So, yeah. So, so it's a it's it's one of the things that wholesalers sometimes do that <clears throat> I think has 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 caused uh, some of their own problems and why we have regulations. Something like that, not telling the homeowner uh, what their property is really worth. You know, you know, realtors will do a a, a broker's buyer's price opinion, you know, uh, they'll do comps, they'll, they do a good faith estimate, they let a, a potential home seller know what they think the fair market value of their home is. And then the realtor is just simply taking a commission off of that sale, right? A, a, a wholesaler is doing the opposite of that. They're they, the last thing they want to do is let her know what the fair market value of their home is, because that because the wholesaler wants to get it under contract for way below fair market value. Yeah. So they're 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 uh, you know, and and so and 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 uh, so I think homeowners when they find out that the you know the true value of their home and, and how give it up to the wholesaler, and the wholesaler is not really buying the home at all anyway, and that a lot of the stuff the wholesalers told them to get it under contract doesn't appear to be true, um, they get really mad. Um, Maybe, and, and, and I think maybe they call their congressman, their, their state senator, state legislature, um, 
And so it's, I think maybe it's not just the Oklahoma Real Estate Commission or Association of Realtors. Well, the, what you said, like you said, the, the Association of Realtors that um, that's the non-governmental entity, mm -hmm. that's the lobbying t tool to lobby the, the, the legislature for new law. Uh, I think they are, you know, absolutely 100% behind this statute and think that it's a great, great for the public. But I also think the public has, has, has felt the uh, sting of of um, of uh, sharp wholesalers. Let's say let's say it that way. That that maybe have ruined it for the uh, the uh, principled wholesaler who goes in with to a homeowner, letting them know I'm I'm going to try to resell this at up. I think a fair markup is you know five grand, whatever ten grand. And uh, so this would be our contract. I'm going to market it and sell it to it to one of my list of investors. It's going to be quick. I'm going to facilitate that. I'm doing all the hard work of finding these deals and bring them to the investors because the investors, they're not out there knocking on the doors, finding these off market properties. That's the, that's what I bring to the deal. And a home, and if a homeowner knows that and knows that the guy's selling it for a markup and is okay with that, then, then there's no, there's no harm. I don't think that that's hanging. And I think that's why, why now they, they have to be uh, licensed, at least if they're going to publicly market it. Yeah. What's that mean? Publicly market. Um, I have an idea, but I, but I think that uh, if I was an unlicensed wholesaler, I'd be a little worried about what a, um, uh, any kind of, of, uh, of enforcement arm of the Oklahoma Real Estate Commission, uh, state of Oklahoma, or uh, even or the county prosecutor thinks is publicly marketing. Do you, if do, is publicly marketing mean that you have a Facebook page or a, a website that says that you, you know that you buy homes and and um, and uh, resell those to investors? I think that's even definitely it, public. It, or does it publicly market mean that specific contract, you know, that specific home where you put that up and it's, and, 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 and you've, and it's identified specifically identifiable as, um, as being public, you know, being publicly marketed that particular interest in that particular home and contract. I personally um, don't think that, I personally don't think that yeah. any, any of those homes should, that are under contract should be, publicly marketed um at all and, and yeah but what does that mean I, well for for in in the sake of, of of for me is if if you are because you're selling a contract and not the home you should not be displaying the home anywhere and it you should you should have enough wits about yourself to develop a relationship with enough uh, flippers that would want this type of inventory where you can make a phone call, send a private email and send a text. We all know those things are private because those are protected amongst us for privacy laws. So if you can send an email to somebody, a text message or a phone call, that's not public. Now, if you blast it out to a thousand people on a, you know, random, there's a relationship. Just like if I was raising money, I can only raise from friends, friends and family, unless I have some type of agreement that says blah, 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 blah to publicly market for money. So I think in that same context, they should not be doing that. And that's where you just find bad business practices amongst wholesalers to begin with. And I think the narrative of the sharp wholesalers are really, it, de it depends who's telling the story. I mean, there's a lot of great stories um, that are not publicized because it doesn't fit the narrative of who's ever trying to lobby against them. I mean, I just bought a yeah. house yesterday of someone who was, was uh, a few days away from uh, a few days away from losing their house to a uh, foreclosure, <clears throat> and they needed money out of that deal in order to get into an apartment or a new condo, but they then had to stay there thirty days after the house was purchased. This is something that this is I mean, you know this is something that traditional real estate transactions can't do. And so you got to, you know, this is, there is a need for this type of property because if not, you're going to see a sharp incline on uh, foreclosures because the end investor that flips the property is not going to make that type of deal with the seller. They'd just rather wait for it to go to the courthouse steps. 
But savvy investors will say, you know what? If I get a discounted rate, I'll let you stay a month. I'll pay you now, you know, and they see the value in that. And so a fair market, yeah. a fair market value of a home is more than just what a comparable analysis is. It's more of what the situation of the home is. Um, there's the situation of the home and the seller that makes the market value of the home different because you're not going to buy a house and keep the past owners in there for 30 days. And, you know, a lot of people know that when you go to a car dealership and you trade your car in, you're not getting the fair market value. If you got the fair market value, there would be no used car dealerships. And so, you know, it's, it's you, all yeah, you're, you're exactly right. When you trade it in, you're getting the uh, trade in value not the uh, book value. Everybody Correct. knows that you trade in, you're getting trade in and, and uh, or wholesale price, not exactly. the fair market price. And I think that's a, an excellent analogy. And I think that a principled wholesaler, um, that's the way that they should, that's, that's real, frankly, that's the way they should have been doing this all along in Correct. Oklahoma. And it, so that there wasn't a bunch of homeowners feeling like they got cheated or lied to um, enough so that the uh, that the um, efforts by the and the and the stories by the realist the, the association of realtors with the legislature rang true. You know, I mean, the the the, the, uh, the, the, the problems had to have been you know uh, uh, real enough that the legislature would make this this uh, this change in the law. Let me ask you, um, given all that, um, uh, would you, uh, you know, I guess they don't have a law like this in North Carolina, but would you continue to uh, wholesale now that uh, you could be in the slammer for up to six months <laughs> and, and, you know, in county jail in, uh, say, Pottawatomie County, Oklahoma? Well, if you even know where that is. You know, <laughs> I don't, but I don't, don't, don't want to know. Your Cool your heels in uh, the, the county jail for even a month, you know. So, I mean, that's the I, I, that's what the uh, wholesalers will have to be willing to risk. Um, is this going to be like speeding laws where, you know, everybody speeds, but hardly anybody gets, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a, a, anything more than a ticket? Uh, you know, it's a, you know, you know, the, you know, misdemeanor crimes always are a fine and imprisonment up to. Mm -hmm. six months or a, a year, but nobody ever gets, I say nobody ever gets in prison. I mean, I, I suppose somebody does, but you know, is this going to be like that? You just pay a, pay a, pay a ticket and keep on going or, or, or is uh, you're going to show up at the courthouse and they're going to say, Hey, did you bring your toothbrush? Cause you're sticking <laughs> around. Buddy. You know, Brian, what I think is, is going to be interesting is when one of these cases actually go to court, and it has to be argued in front of a judge or it may even go to trial at a certain point. I, I'll be very interested to see that if a larger wholesaler that has some pockets that would want to prove a point on how enforceable this law is. Um, I, personally, I wouldn't test it. If I was in Oklahoma, <laughs> no, I just, it's just not worth it to me. Um, but personally... If I was in Oklahoma, I would seek counsel from somebody like yourself, make sure that my contracts are airtight, make sure that I would my, my buy contracts, my sell contracts are airtight to help me uh, do my business within the, the requirements of the law. You know, in any entrepreneur, no matter what field of business you're in, there's always going to be some type of regulation that is passed that makes you change the way you do business. Um, I have a bunch of attorney friends since I'm in this business and one of their rules, and I don't know how this rules, how long this rule has been in contact, but you can't be the first person to reach out to a client. Even though you know they need your help, you can't solicit other than through mail or, you know, some other way. You can't pick up the phone and call and say, hey, look, I've seen you on the news. Uh, I know that you may need criminal. I'm, I'm the guy for you. So in North Carolina, you can't do that. You have to can't do it here either. So at some point in time, I'm guessing there was a regulation that was passed that changed that. So prior to that, people were, attorneys were reaching out to clients probably, and that's how they got clients. And then there's probably some rule that changed that says you can't do that anymore because of some case law that came down. So as an, oh, entre yeah, I, yeah. So as an entrepreneur- yeah, remember the movie with Danny DeVito where he would show up at the hospital and 
and I have people in the <laughs> hospital bed sign a, a contract to retain the, uh, the his attorney. He was so, a uh, para lawyer. Para law. <laughs> <laughs> well, so as an entrepreneur, you have to roll with the punches. And so if there is a law, it's probably put in place for a good reason. And you follow the law and circum and, and use the loopholes or use the legal way so that you can, you know, still continue to do business within the law. And so that's going to require Oklahoma wholesalers to one, either go out and get your license or two, seek counsel uh, so that you can get, make sure your contracts are airtight and so that you can navigate an actual transaction the way that you're supposed to, that's it, so that you don't pay a thousand dollar fine or spend six months in jail for, you know, buying and buying and selling a piece of property. So Brian, do you, do you have any, any final words for the wholesalers that probably that you may pass in, in the courtroom one day going to jail or, or somebody, <laughs> or somebody that may be coming to your office to ask for help? Do you have any departing words for them? Uh, yeah. Um, do not publicly market your, uh, your contracts and uh, think about doing dual closings where you're you're uh, you're not really marketing the interest in the contract. You're simply taking title and then uh, reselling, and possibly consider having the dual closings be um, separated by perhaps a day or or several days, and using a bridge loan to facilitate the closing. There are many, many people that uh, you probably heard them called hard money lenders yep. that would um, uh, uh, lend the money to you as the wholesaler, probably at a at a rate, you know, oh, that would allow you to uh, have the money to close the front side of the deal. And they uh, realize that they're that uh, that they're going to be uh, immediately paid off from a, a, a subsequent sale mm -hmm. to an in investor. Um, the investor themselves may even loan you the money um, if they're, if they, uh, if they're uh, have the wherewithal to do that. Uh, but, you know, use some sort of a bridge loan, hard money loan, close that first deal, go into title, have a day or two or week um, before the, the, uh, the, the subsequent sale occurs. And I don't, I, I, I think you're, uh, you're, then it's like, well, you know, I, I own the property. I was in title. I resold mm -hmm. it. I, I, I have, there is no time hol holding period. At least there's no holding period in the current statute. Um, so, you know, uh, so that I would, I would have them consider those kind of things to, to just, uh, to get it one step further away from, publicly marketing your interest as the buyer in that in that one contract that you're now assigning to a to a wholesale I mean to an investor for a for a, a for a, a kind of a flip fee or commission fee mm -hmm. just st you know get a step away from that and I don't think you'll have to be uh, licensed you know but but don't publicly market you know or don't don't you can't, I, I, like, I like to say, you can't call a chicken a duck and make it a duck. So, <laughs> so don't, don't publicly market under some other words or, or methodology and think that you're not going to get uh, dinged by the statute if there's any interest in enforcing it. And I, I can see there being some interest in enforcing it if, if a homeowner thinks they got cheated lost a bunch of money and um, and called the uh, Oklahoma Real Estate Commission and made a complaint. Yeah, I absolutely think that they would investigate that and follow up and possibly prefer charges. Absolutely. I think you're I think you're dead on. Um, my advice to anybody listening to this from Oklahoma is, is seek counsel and uh, if you want to continue doing this business, seek counsel to figure out how you can do so. And if it's worth it to you, do that. And if you want to get in touch with Brian or anybody else at his law firm, you can go to uh, Huddleston.law. Uh, and um, oh, thank you. He, he may reach out to you and he, 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 he may give you some good advice or he may tell you to kick rocks. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, 
but definitely uh, reach reach out to Brian. He's he's definitely educated and, and well versed in this in, in real estate itself, and um, he can help you out and and uh, navigate you in the right direction. So Brian, I, I appreciate your time, and um, maybe if there's something that comes on the case law and there's actually a case, I would love to. I would I'm gonna be look, looking out for it, and if so. I would love for you to come back on and kind of dissect what happened in that in that cake, course case. Watch this space for updates. Got it. Watch Max Maxwell for updates. I like that. Thank you, man. I appreciate it so much, Brian, and uh, I enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you so much.